So if you're new here, I'm Kate from Venison for Dinner, and we have a milk cow. We've had milk cows off and on for the last 10 or 11 years, and in the past when we had milk cows, I would still buy some different dairy products, but we committed to being 100% dairy sufficient when we bought this last cow in July. That means I make all our own dairy products. We don't buy any, and it's been really rewarding. There's been some trial and error, but I hope that sharing my knowledge will help you guys. I have a four-part series as well on how to milk a cow, how to clean a cow's udder, what do we do with all this milk, how do we pick a cow, how do we feed a cow, how do I get a cow bread, all those sort of things, and I'll link those below. And I hope you enjoy this quick, what you need to make a cheese make, what you need to make cheese video. I'm here today, hiding in my spare bedroom away from my loud children, and I'm gonna show you what you need to get started making your own cheese. So if you want to make your own cheese, there's plenty of cheeses you can make without special tools. There's plenty of things you can MacGyver and use what you have, but a lot of those cheeses are going to be more fresh, perishable cheeses that either have a short shelf life or have to be frozen or have to be in the fridge or you got to eat quick before they're going to go bad. And if you want to become dairy sufficient, you want to buy a milk cow and you want to stop buying all dairy from the store, you need to get a little more serious. I'm not gonna show you fancy tools. What I have here is only essentials. People get into really fancy things and I don't think that's necessary. I don't have time for fancy things. Someone told me once, oh I have this friend, like I was talking to this person in person and they make their own cheese and they were talking about this other local person who makes their own cheese and oh she does it right, she does it on a copper pot outside over the fire and I'm like, that's really neat, but I need to be making cheese while homeschooling my children, while feeding a baby, while cleaning my kitchen. Mama don't got time for copper pot over a fire, okay? Okay. So you're gonna want a couple good cheese making books. There's plenty of online resources, and those are really great, but I need books. I have two cheese making books, and they both have different approaches. One is 200 Easy Homemade Cheeses by Deborah Amory and Boys, and one is The Art of Natural Cheese Making by David Asher. David is actually a friend of ours, and he's actually David. You'll see my name in the foreword, and when he's thanking people, you see my name. And the cow in here is one of our milk cows that we had in the past. So that's pretty fun. Almost all the cheeses are made with that milk from Wilderness's Milk. David would milk our cow for us and take the milk so that he could make these cheeses. So, David is a very natural, old school way. Sometimes a little too intense. Deborah is a very, but you could also use this book to make milk from pasteurized, make cheese from pasteurized milk, whereas David's book, there's very few recipes you could use pasteurized milk for. I quite often use some of David's natural methods with Deborah's recipes, because Deborah's recipes are like very like step one, step two, step three, step four. I like that. Um, there's some recipes in here that are a little bit too much by feel for me, whereas these ones are a little more cut and dry. So I use both. Like I love this feta recipe. I love this cheddar recipe. I love this Asiago recipe. These are my favorite books. You're gonna need a cheese press. There's no two ways about it. You can MacGyver cheese presses that are real difficult to work with, but you need to make or buy a cheese press. You can't make reliable wheels, bigger wheels of cheese without it. Mine is one we bought, but you could make it yourself. So, it has, this is a piece of pipe. This is a cutting board. So it has, the pipe goes on the base and I line it with cheesecloth and I put the cheese in and then I put this top piece in and then a spring goes on there and then this goes on here and it screws on and it twists down to give the pressure. It takes up a minimal amount of space. It's not huge to store. When it's pressing, I put it inside of a cheese pot so that the whey is just catching in here and it's easy to move around. 
um, you need a big pot to make cheese. It's non-negotiable. This is an inexpensive stainless steel pot that has seen a lot of wear. You can get heavy bottom ones, you can get fancier ones. This one was like under $30 and it holds a four gallon batch of cheese, just. Um, this is technically a five gallon pot. It doesn't fit five gallons of milk and my four gallon pot only fits three gallons of milk. So I don't know what form of measurement they're using, but get a gallon bigger than you intend to use. So if you want to make four gallon batches of cheese, which is a very standard batch of cheese, buy a five gallon pot. Now, if you're wanting to make things like fetas and brie's and camemberts and that sort of thing, you're going to need cheese molds. These are very inexpensive. Um, these are ones I was given actually, and they're just a basket. You can MacGyver these as well, but they're pretty inexpensive to buy. And if you're ordering from a cheese making place, why not? You can make them out of yogurt containers and such, but I do like having these. You're going to need cheesecloth and not the cheesecloth you'll get at your grocery store. That stuff is no good. It's all fine weave and it's all no, no. This is thin cotton, organic cotton muslin. It's cut and sewed in squares. I have a few of them and they're great. I use them so much for straining yogurt, for making cheese. Definitely worth it. You could buy a yard of this stuff and make four of these. It's excellent. Just a really thin cotton fabric is all you want. These sometimes will hold on to smells but if you boil some water with a bit of baking soda and then swirl this around in there for a minute, smells be gone. You're gonna need rennet. And I should say these items are in no particular order. This is just as I grab things. Rennet is much needed. Buy animal rennet. Don't buy vegetable or microbial rennet. Um, there's some politics to this. Uh, I think animal rennet works better, more consistently. Whether you buy liquid or tablets is up to you. I think liquid's easier to use. Tablets has a longer shelf life. Rennet, so let's go into layman's terms here. You nurse your baby and your baby spits up some. It doesn't come up as milk. It comes up as like little curds and clear liquid. It's curds and whey. Your breast milk has reacted with your baby's stomach lining, the rennet in their stomach lining. Rennet is present in any mammal's stomach that's only had milk. So this is calf rennet. So you're thinking, wait, they had to kill a calf to get this? Well, guess what, guys? They kill a lot of calves anyways. A lot of bull calves simply get knocked on the head and chucked out. Disgusting. I know, but when there's not a market for them, farmers aren't raising them. So when there's a demand for animal rennet, they don't just knock those calves on the heads. Those calves get used for rennet. And so it makes it more of a full circle. You'll need some sort of culture. In Deborah's book, she uses all freeze dried cultures, thermophilic, mesophilic, this and that. I don't use any of those. Um, I also don't make like blue cheeses and camemberts. Those get trickier to not use freeze dried cultures. I use David's method, which is using yogurt whey, which um, just, you know, like you, your yogurt sometimes has like that yellowish greenish liquid. That's whey and that's yogurt whey and it's rich with natural cultures. And yogurt whey can be used as either, either a thermophilic or a mesophilic culture. So, David's method is a quarter cup of whey per gallon of milk. So, every couple weeks to a month, whenever I make yo when I make yogurt, I'll strain a batch. I need whey for the baby's formula anyways. So, I pretty much always have some in the fridge, except for it turns out I just ran out when I made formula yesterday. So, I need to make some ASAP and I can't show you what it looks like. But it lasts weeks, you could make a batch, you could freeze it. You can also save whey from your cheese because it has those cultures then. You can save some of that to be culture in your next batches. If you're wanting to make quick mozzarella, which is my favorite method, you're gonna need citric acid. Um, this works really well for me. 
There's more natural ways to do it. Not that this is really unnatural, but citric acid is a corn derivative, and if some people are really against that. You could get really deep into politics and ethics, and I'm just not going to right now. Citric acid method works really well for us. A couple other tools. You're gonna need a thermometer, instant read thermometer. This is just an instant read meat thermometer. I use this for cheese making, for bread making, for meat making, for all sorts of things. I use it pretty much every day. I think it was $13. They're inexpensive. Get you one. You're gonna need a long handled knife. This is just my bread knife and I use it to cut curds. Nothing fancy, just my bread knife. Um, this is a wooden spoon that my husband made. You can use a metal spoon, you can use a wooden spoon. You just need a big spoon. You probably already have that, but mom thought I should just show you guys anyways. This is also for making cheese, but I honestly don't use it for making cheese that much. I more use it for when I deep fry. So, there you go. If, so then it gets into where are we going to age cheese? If you are wanting to make fancier cheeses, like in my mind, fancier cheeses, like blue cheeses and camemberts and those sort of things, those you have to get into like this humidity thing and different sort of things. But I don't have experience with those because I don't like any of those cheeses, so I can't weigh in on those. My mom just used to use like clear Rubbermaid totes and such, and that's how she did hers. Where we live now, we have a root cellar, and I'm spoiled with that. Before we had a root cellar, I aged cheeses in the fridge. Just put them in the back of the fridge. Is it the most ideal place? No. Is it gonna work just fine? Yeah. Do we live in a perfect world? No. Are we gonna do the best we can? Yes. Um, I used to wax cheeses, but that kind of was not working for me so well. I don't like the paraffin waxes. I actually mostly vacuum seal cheeses with a vacuum sealer because I find it really low maintenance for me. We have a vacuum sealer and like a food saver. It's not actually a food saver brand, but you know what I mean. Um, I'll link cars below. It's a little on the spendy side, but we use it for fish and other things. And it was an investment we made four years ago and we use it all the time. So I find vacuum sealing. Um, with vacuum sealing, you have to make sure that your wheels of cheeses, so they say you air dry it after it comes out of the press, sometimes they need to brine, sometimes you need to air dry, and it needs to feel like a clammy handshake. I find when you're vacuum sealing, you have to go a little more dry than that. Um, and that took a bit of playing around and figuring out. I started making hard cheeses. I didn't make them for a lot of years because my mom made them. Um, but then I kind of needed to take over making them and then we didn't have a cow for five years and then we got so right now it's February and we got Annabelle in July to start off with I had a really hard time with cheeses her milk is higher protein which is really great for making cheese but because I was used to a different lower protein milk that makes cheese a little differently I messed up a few cheeses for sure um, a few of them ended up getting fed to the pigs, but some of the cheeses, it just ends up that maybe they're not exactly how you intended, but they're still good cheeses and you can still make a lasagna or make mac and cheese or snack on them or whatever. It's, yeah, it just depends on what you're willing to do. Very rarely are they truly just pig food. Mostly they just didn't end up how you intended. But every good cheese was invented by someone messing up a process and hey look, now we have blue cheese. Or hey look, now we have Parmesan, right? Like it's, it's all was not necessarily messing up, but you changed something and oh look, I made something new. The process of making a wheel of cheese takes about four hours. There's a lot of hands off time. Um, but don't start it at eight o'clock at night if you wanna to go to bed at nine o'clock at night, that's not gonna work well for you. My best is that I either start it kind of mid-afternoon by four o'clock or I do it first thing in the morning. So like I milk the cow, I strain the milk, I put it right into the cheese pot. So instead of having to warm up the milk to add the culture, it actually comes out of the cow at the perfect temperature to make cheese. How perfect is that? So if you're making something like 
feta or gouda, you actually never even have to put the pot of milk on, a ch on the stove. It just, it's warm enough to deal with and there's never a point where you have to put that pot on the stove. So if you're not wanting to use the oven in summer or you have limited resources in that way, something like feta or gouda, if made with fresh milk, never even has to go on the stove. So recently, I feel like I've really hit my stride with cheese making, and now that I say that, I'm probably gonna have a good run of messing things up. But I just find the more I streamline some different things and learn what can be streamlined and what can't. Like some recipes say, um, now you're gonna stir this for an hour. No, I'm not. I'm not gonna stir that for an hour. I'm gonna stir it for a minute, and then I'm gonna wash dishes for a couple minutes. And I'm gonna stir it for a minute. Then I'm gonna help a kid with his schoolwork for a couple minutes. And then I'm gonna stir it for a minute. And yes, I have to be in the kitchen for an hour, but I'm not actually sitting there just making cheese and stirring it the whole time. I don't got time for that. Is me doing this stirring process gonna turn out a little different than if I sat there and stirred it for an hour? Yes, probably. Am I okay with this? Yes, totally.